Hello, welcome to lecture number one, or I guess technically lecture number two. Um, going to discuss tensile testing and um, the test itself and the data that it generates and how to analyze that data. So first slide shows um, the actual uh, geometry of a tensile test specimen or sample. Um, this cross-sectional uh, diameter here is 0 0.505 inches. There's a reason for that. I'll tell you in a sec. Um, the, there's a length uh, within the reduced section that's called our gauge length, and that's uh, across that point, those two points, those two endpoints, uh, we'll attach an extensometer that'll measure uh, the changes in length during the test. Uh, there's a, a reduced section uh, here compared to the dimensions of the outer, uh, larger dimension here. And the reason that this is shaped like this, we call it a, a dog bone shape, is because this, this uh, center area with a smaller diameter will be where the failure happens. And we want that. We want the, we want the uh, elongation and failure of the sample to happen in here where we're monitoring it and not in the, uh, in the grips that are holding the sample or anywhere else really. So that's why there's a the reduced cross section there. And like I said, within that, there'll be a length, we call the gauge length, and we're gonna measure through time how that two inches expands or increases during the test. There, there's a American Society for Testing Materials, ASTM, designated um, description protocol, and this is number 638. So during the test, um, this uh, image here could be flipped. Uh, the big machine that we have on campus that you may have seen a test run with has uh, the screws uh, above and the crosshead that's moving is this piece right here, whereas the bottom part is stationary and within that is a load cell. So the sample is threaded on the ends and screwed in to this bottom place here where it's going to actually pick up on the load generated. The top of the sample is also screwed into a fixture that's attached to the, to the moving platen or the moving crosshead. It, uh, it's kind of obvious this is our test sample, but then we have this device that's attached and if I were to expand that we have our reduced area of the sample and like i mentioned earlier there would be a gauge length that would be um, preset and it's across that gauge length that we would attach this extensometer And this would be called L sub zero, the original length between the two ends or the two grips of the extensometer. As the test runs, then that those, those points will move along with the extension of the sample so that we can check, so that we can measure the length at any point in time and know how much the, t the sample has lengthened. So what that's going to generate is the extensometer is going to give us uh, here the, let's see if I can get white. So 
Okay. Apologize here. I'm not able to change the color of this pen. I don't know why. Anyway, um, this x-axis is extension. So zero would be where the gauge length is, in this case, was two inches or whatever that starting point is. That would be zero. And what this is measuring is how much longer that sample's getting during the test. Not the length of the sample, but the change in length of the sample during the test. And the y-axis is whatever the load or force that load cell is seeing as the sample is being extended. So what's being controlled is what we call stroke, the length uh, or the space or distance between the two crossheads of the test machine. And what we're measuring is the load that that takes over time. So we're going to be we're going to be able to see how much load that takes, and we're going to generate a curve where we'll see that load increase with respect to the length linearly for some point, and then it will start to deform, and this will no longer be linear until it reaches a maximum, and then it will start to drop and then there'll be failure. And so we can know what the load level is at its maximum. We can know what the load level is when it stops being linear. And if all I'm making are, are parts that have the same dimension, then I could just stick with those loads and compare samples knowing that their dimensions are the same. But if the dimensions of the samples change, then I have to have a way of removing that as a factor because I really only want to know what's happening in the material and not the material at a given dimension. So that's the reason that we can't just stick a, with a load on the y-axis and extension on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we need something that is, is independent of the geometry of the part and that's called stress. And in the x-axis, we need something also that's independent of the, 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 the length originally of the part that, that I can get rid of that as a factor and only be considering the changes in length oh, uh, for that part. And so what we'll use here on the x-axis is something called strain. So if I had that sample, that, that cylindrical sample that I was mentioning, we were looking at earlier, and it has a cross-section, cross-sectional area, we might recall that, we, that, that for, those, uh, for that standard sample size, this diameter was equal to 0.505 inches. Now, assuming that we're going to stay in that uh, unit system, if, uh, if we have 0 0.505 inches for diameter, what we care about is the cross-sectional area, and that's going to be pi r squared or pi d squared over 4, because um, r is equal to d over 2. And if I insert 0.505 here, then my value for um, area is going to end up being exactly 0 0.2, which is kind of handy. So my stress is going to be equal to whatever this load level is divided by that cross-sectional area, force over area. And strain is going to be the change in the length between those two uh, grips of the extensometer, the change in the length over the original gauge length. So here's an image just kind of showing you what, um, what we mean. If we had a, 
a rectangular or square cross section. It would be this image. We're applying a force. If we want to get rid of the factor of the size of the sample, then we would divide by that cross sectional area and we get stress equal to force over area. Units for stress um, could be if we have uh, 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 the, the load, um, sorry, uh, PSI units, then we'd have force would be in pounds and the cross-sectional area would be square inches, pounds per square inch PSI. We'll typically be using CGS units, um, and so we'll have uh, newtons for our force and meters squared for our cross-sectional area, and that's equal to a Pascal. Typically, <clears throat> our measured cross-sectional area won't be in square meters. You can imagine that would be a big. Um, but typically, square centimeters or square millimeters. So then we would have to convert that to square meters. And we'll, I'll show you that in a sec. So here's how we measure strain. We might start out, this is the distance between those two ends of the extensometer. We might start out with L0, the gauge length, and then as the test proceeds, the sample gets longer by delta L. And that change in length over the original length is equal to strain. Both of those, change in length and original length, would have the same units and so there's no units for strain. Okay, so here's our dis, uh, definition of what we call elastic deformation. First part of the deformation of a sample will be linear. So I have my load or my stress, sorry, my stress in the Y, my strain in the X. As I apply load and the stress increases, my response will be linear at first. And if at any point in time I take the load off of my sample, then this trait will trace right back to zero. I, can, I will have the same slope if I apply compression. And again, when I remove that compressive load, the trace will go right back to zero as long as I've stayed in the linear region. So that slope, that relationship, the ratio to the stress, of the stress to the strain, that is called the modulus of elasticity. Modulus of elasticity is the ratio of the stress to the strain. We can rewrite that equation here with Hooke's Law. In this case, um, E would be would represent the spring constant. Um, the, the basically the, the coefficient that relates stress and strain. The correlation. Okay, so you're going to see data in two different forms. Traditionally, we used to only have a graph, and um, Typically, and I can't tell you exactly why, but typically the load is given a symbol of P and the extension delta X. And so this is a typical stress strain curve. The initial part is linear, then it goes nonlinear, reaches a maximum, then drops, and then failure. Sometimes, instead of getting this graph, you'll be given the data directly. So at different points along the test, you'll be given the load level and the extension level. Depending on how the, you're presented with that data, that will determine the method that you should use in analyzing the data. Okay, so method one, here's I'm given data, load and extension data, in this case in, in newtons and in millimeters, 
I'm told that the gauge length is 63.5 millimeters and that the cross-sectional area is 61.1 square millimeters. So to get my values of, of stress, I need to divide each of these load levels by the cross-sectional area, 61.1. For strain, I need to take each of my extension values and divide it by the original gauge length, 63.5. So for the first data point, and I can't use this box because I can't seem to get rid of black as my color. So I'm going to write over here to the left um, uh, that my stress one for data point one would be equal to 1400 newtons divided by 61.1 square meters, I'm sorry, square millimeters. So what's that? So that is uh, about 23, 22.9, 23, 23 newtons per millimeter squared. And I want the value to be in Pascal. Pascals are newtons per meter squared. So I'm going to take that and I know that there's a thousand millimeters per meter. So I'm going to square that. And now I've got 23 times 10 to the 6 Pascal. And 10 to the 6 Pascal is a megapascal, so that's 23 megapascals. So my um, Stress one, stress level one is 23 megapascals. Okay, I think I fixed this issue with our, yeah. Um, so, so I'm gonna have, here's my stress. This is in megapascal. And this value will be 23. And then for strain, it doesn't have any units. I've got an extension of 0 0.03 millimeters. The original length was 63.5 millimeters. So we're talking 0 0.0005 as my strain value. So we'll continue to do that all the way down. 2800 newtons divided by 61. 0.1 square millimeters. That's going to give me a value of 46 and 0 0.08 divided by 63.5. This is 0 0.0012. And we'll go on and fill all those out. 0.0015 